are at the second day of this uh, summer school, and I'm glad to introduce uh, Professor Cornelia Hahn, who is the professor of, at the Paris London University of Salzburg. Prof uh, Cornelia, he is a professor of, of general sociology theory at the Department of Sociology and Cultural Science at the University of Salzburg, in which she also chairing. She contributes mainly to the departmental research cluster, Culture of Modernity, from a social constructivist perspective. Her research interests refer to transformation through media in postmodernity. Current projects and publications include theorizing phenomena and dynamics on the organization of the new media communication, intimate relationship, body therapy, and clothing. She received the academic degree, including habilitation from the University of Bonn, Germany. Uh, Cornelia is a great scholar and also a great friend. I'm pleased to have her here with us. I have also to say that uh, she will take advantage of a new partnership we have between the University of Salzburg and Bologna. And luckily, we will also host Cornelia in person and not just uh, via Zoom pretty soon. Uh, if I'm not wrong, right at the end of this month. Am I correct, Cornelia? Yes, you're very correct. Thank you very much. I'm looking in my uh, calendar and I think I it will be the 25th. Wednesday the 25th, so. Yeah, correct. So advertisement <laughs> for those who have a chance. Being we will, definitely, we will send out uh, an email reminder of your visit to all student uh, of the summer school, uh, master degree and bachelor degree, of course. So I'm glad to listen for this uh, lesson today. I'm Cornelia, stage is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, Pier Giorgio, and uh, for inviting me um, and for the very kind introduction. And I'm very excited and happy being with you to this summer school. Um, I can't yet share my screen. What I'm trying to do. You should be able right now. Okay, perfect. Yes. You, you can see it. Yes. So, um, um, I propose this title. I, I know that the summer school has this very interesting and really very timely topic, digitalization and platformization of social worlds. And um, this is right in, of what I'm very much interested in, in my uh, current research. And also, um, as Pier Giorgio said, um, dating back some years, even decades, um, before we even had digital technologies. Um, I was very much interested in the organization and communication of social worlds and uh, specifically on the change of um, this organization, what we call nowadays the transformation of social worlds. Um, and I do think that when we talk of social worlds, so we today talk primarily of digital worlds and I think this is the most timely and the most relevant transformation and what I want to do is that I would like to go back a little bit and um, ask about the roots of digitalization and also of platformization and I do think that digitalization and platformization has um, indeed several roots. It is um, very important to add beyond digital technology. So my overall argument of my current research is that uh, digitalization, and um, this is a question at stake here, platformization doesn't start with digital technology, with our contemporary digital technology, but it starts with the digitalization and also with the platformization of social, of the organization of social world. world. So the organizational traits are earlier than the contemporary digital technology. So this is the overall theoretical frame um, of what I'm going to talk about. And um, 
I restrict myself to a very specific topic, and this is uh, privacy, private life, and um, private lifestyle, and um, related to the idea of platform economies. So what I would like to do is I would like to uh, structure this talk into three parts. The first is that I introduce the concept of bourgeois privacy um, just quickly. And then I um, want to talk more specifically uh, on domestic service work, basically in the 1900th century, around 1900, beginning of 20, 20th century. So this means I go way back for more than 100 years. And um, the idea is, as I said earlier, can we see um, these domestic service already as a human kind of human platform um, on which the platformization, I, I stick to this example, the platformization um, we, are, we have today uh, is based on. Um, when it comes to domestic service, service work and platformization. What we have today is, for example, that we have these kind of delivery services. So we have, um, for example, this is a just an illustration on this picture, that food is delivered. So you can order, as everybody knows, you can order food and dishes and you have a great variety among them. You can order them online. Um, by using different apps and platforms, and they are delivered predominantly by um, um, these carriers using bicycles to your house. And um, so, of course, what is the crucial difference if we compare the system with the historical system is that these servants, if we want to call them servants as well, they are not live in servants. So they are live out servants, obviously. And um, when we talk about the concept of bourgeois privacy, so they relied on live in servants. However, <clears throat> the point is that um, these live in Let me add a P. <laughs> the point is that um, these live-in services are quite comparable, or these live-out services are quite comparable to um, the uh, previous service culture. And my argument is that uh, we can actually compare the what we call nowadays the gig work or the gig, ec uh, gig economies with um, these kind of bourgeois household economies being based on service workers. So there are some parallels, parallels um, so that we can actually see these domestic service work in the past as a kind of platform. So a platform was created um, which supported and fostered uh, the gig economy nowadays. So my argument is that it is beyond digital technology. So it is this um, platform um, who already uh, prepared for having this very rapid implementation of um, gig economies um, and service work uh, nowadays based on our apps. And um, I mean, what, we, what I will talk about later on is that um, unfortunately, I mean, there are some shared uh, traits which are not, not very positively. So it is precarious work, particularly in the past. It was um, gendered work um, resulting in um, particular low wage partic for, for women and also in a um, certain power relationship between the employers and the employees. Um, I just want to briefly recall what is the concept of bourgeois privacy. Um, privacy 
basically was a mean of, first of all, having a kind of private, this means the not open discourses um, of a group of people who were politically powerless the, power, the politically powerless bourgeois uh, class, however, which by this discourse created um, a sense of awareness for themselves as a social class. So they, in, in these private discourses, I mean, we know the famous coffee houses and we can recall the famous theory transformation of the public sphere and the political impact by um, elaborated on by Jürgen Habermas, and uh, he sticks to the very famous coffee houses where ideas were discussed. Um, again, it was a gendered society, however, so um, women were excluded from this discussion. Um, however, ideas were discussed, and uh, in this process, so there was a self-awareness for the bourgeois class. Uh, in addition, it goes along with the industrialization and the idea of um, increased productivity. So the bourgeois class also wanted to be productive and um, productive in two ways. So first of all, productive as business people. So um, they were the owner of the industrialized uh, factories and they employed workers in huge numbers there and also kind of productive, also reproductive in their private life. And the private life, there was the idea of, there was the idea of uh, keeping the private life separately from the public life. So by creating a bourgeois household, um, this was first of all regarded as a kind of retreat for the successful business men. So basically the women had to um, provide for this retreat um, in uh, both as a uh, as it, as it was referred to in, in, in those days in the 1920s, early 20th century as the mistress of the household. So the wife of the businessman um, who had to manage this bourgeois household, but also very much um, it, it, the bourgeois household was run by the domestic servants. And um, predominantly female domestic servants at that time. So what did they want to produce and to, reprodu to reproduce? They want to produce and reproduce a culture of class distinction. First of all, a class distinction from the working classes, but also in some ways from um, a distinction from aristocracy, even though they uh, kept on later to, as we see on this image, to have a very luxurious uh, inside of their private households and um, um, as a part of this class distinction, also kind of paradox that, they, uh, that the business man uh, has to kind of show off that he is um, successful by entertaining such a very elaborate household and a very elaborate house. So um, I just want to have a brief look on this slide, which I skipped initially, um, just to have an illustration of what I'm talking about right now, that the bourgeois household is gradually run like a mini factory. Um, and this is also kind of paradox because it was uh, organized and the idea was that it should be right the opposite of a factory. So we have here the image of a factory and we see all these machines standing in one row and we can imagine with a lot of um, workers 
um, serving these machines and um, they are totally um, organized by the rhythm and the pace of these machines. So this is something which uh, differs significantly from uh, crafts manships before. Um, however, what they did in the bourgeois household was also a kind of a kind of industrialized um, work because there were, I have here an image of, I mean, it looks a little bit cluttered, but this is exactly what I wanted to illustrate. I mean, there were so many objects in this household. It was regarded as very cozy, as I said, the retreat. So this included that you have these heavy curtains, that uh, you have uh, a lot of items around you and you can, you, you also want to demonstrate that you can afford all these items. Also, um, a lot of items are also mass produced. So you have the direct connection to the factory now being able to mass produce item, make it affordable for, for a vast uh, group of um, people. Um, what we also see is that uh, these households were very spacious and they had a lot of rooms. What we don't see on these images that it is very spacious, but what we do see is that they have they had a lot of rooms for single purposes, so to play music or to read, or it was seen as indispensable that every household member, family member, I need to say, not the servants, family member has a room for his or herself um, for recreation, but also a lot of rooms for entertainment of guests and so on. So it is something what we really see on this illustration, what Zombat calls the objectification uh, of the household. So this means basically that a lot of objects uh, entered the house, were exposed on display in this house as a kind of class distinction. But also when we look at the, at the um, vast number, but um, when we look at basically rooms which are not such big, they were smaller than in aristocracy. So we uh, get the idea what is also very important to the rise of industrialization and capitalism, according to Zombard, um, that we that here is they created, the household created among the family members, particularly among the spouses, a sense of intimacy. So what I want to highlight is that this intimacy was not there because they were just married, but they, uh, it was created by the organization of this household. And um, there's an interplay between these um, increasing intimacy and also the objectification so that you see that you felt that you need to provide for this cozy home with all these objects, with a whole lot of textiles, for example, um, to just foster an intimacy among the household, the family members of the bourgeois household. Um, so the point is right now that what I've said, that this household was managed by the bourgeois mistress. However, it was run by the domestic servants. So there was a huge, um, um, a whole lot of work to do. I mean, uh, a, a huge number of, of individual tasks which had to be done in this household to maintain and to reproduce the sense of privacy um, and um, material reproduction, a material reproduction of the maintenance of um, these households. Um, so it was um, the, um, I mean, what we still see around 1900 is that at least one domestic servants, but usually more, so depending on what one could afford, uh, more servants um, were employed into these households. There was, was also a strict, distinction between the physical 
uh, labor and this management of the household. The physical labor was done by domestic uh, servants. So in that way, it was already outsourced. So the labor, which was very intensive and very demanding physically, um, or labor which needed a lot of skills was already outsourced uh, in these households. Um, and also, I mean, the, the reason why I, why I show these two ads is that um, the servants usually were found, were looked after and found by uh, commercial ads in newspaper. So there was there were a huge number of these commercial ads at the end of the 19th century and uh, the beginning of the 20th century, a huge number of ads um, coordinating servants and households. And I add these here and I want to highlight it because this is of course what we also have with the digital platforms that the platform coordinate basically the people um, in, for example, the example of the delivery services they coordinate the restaurants providing the foods and the households demanding this food uh, and ordering this food. Um, and again, we have in between, we have still kind of with the delivery services, with these uh, bicycle uh, couriers, we have still in between a human energy source providing um, this work. Um, here is again just to recall that the tasks were numerous, as I said, because they had a very, in, in the bourgeois household, there was a very elaborate way of dressing, traveling, dining, socializing, um, accompanied by um, a lot of tasks to keep all the textiles, to organize, to uh, provide a lot of dishes um, also for guests of the household um, and also um, to maintain, for example, the numerous tableware and also organize the heating and the lighting, which was a major task to do um, without electricity, first of all, without electricity, later with electricity. Um, also coordinating all the servants' work um, was essential. And um, I add these because it is we, what we see is a kind of division of labor, like in the factory. So when I call the house or the mini factory, I want to make, I want to um, highlight the similarity that it was uh, like in the factory. And also that they had cyclical routines, when they need to clean what, so seasonal cleaning routines, but also daily cleaning routines um, of items which, which need to be constant cleaning, washing, dusting, wiping, whatever. Um, and uh, at the same time, also timekeeping agendas, for example, which meals need to be served as precisely what time. So also this is quite similar to the factory and to the work in the factory. Um, up to the point, um, there was also a kind of um, standardization uh, of these bourgeois households, what is kind of also paradox when we want to be really private and uh, excluded from society. Um, because uh, there was a lot of household manuals um, promoting efficient home management. So they followed strict regulation and this was regarded as a state of the art that you actually have to follow these strict regulations and uh, you have to keep the standardization um, of the, of the uh, cleaning routines, for example, and uh, of the whole lifestyle and of course, this was also like um, what I said earlier, the, the pace and the rhythm of the machines um, in, a, in the factory um, after the introduction of the steam power, providing these rhythm and pace. Um, the work conditions um, 
were, as I said, I mean, also quite similar, quite precarious. So there was a high turnover of staff uh, among the domestic servants. Um, what I've said, recruitment often by newspaper ads. What is interesting when we look at the digital apps today, um, they um, came from working class families and often migrants from rural areas uh, working in the bourgeois household in urban areas. And I think there's also some similarity. Um, it is often also nowadays, uh, this in the gig economy and for example, food delivery services that it is kind of low um, of an entry job also for migrants, not necessarily from rural areas, but also from um, other countries, transnational uh, or trans intercontinental migration is often um, involved here. Um, what is still the case is that it is low pay. However, accommodation and food is not yet provided. These are today live out servants. Um, the live in servants um, were closely supervised by their employers. So they were basically, they were allowed <coughs> to leave the house only once a week on Sunday afternoon, for example, um, and um, had to return on a strict time schedule. And I do think that there's also similarity because uh, delivery services today, they also have, of course, a very close supervision by the app. So uh, you can always, supervise where they are, how much time they have taken, and it took them to deliver anything. And it is a kind of, I mean, while in former times, there was a total control of the private life by the employer. So basically, I, I put private into quotation marks because basically domestic servants, they didn't have a private life. So they um, provided the private life of the bourgeois family, but they themselves didn't have a private life. This is a, this is very important. Um, it is just, it is the uh, prerequisite that they don't have a private life, that they are on demand at any time, that they, I, I mean, on, on call at any time, and you can demand for them at any time. And this is the prerequisite that they, so they can't have a private life. And, kind of independent um, private life um, because this is um, what the employers can enjoy and um, with the support of people who don't have a private life. Um, yeah, we see here a very nice picture and um, I think I've already mentioned all these, what is written on this slide, that it is physically demanding and um, that for some task, you need a long-term experience. Um, even though it was not physically demanding, it is a strict hierarchical interaction order between the employers and the employees. Uh, and they didn't have a formal work contract usually. However, they, highly, they were highly dependent from the employ, employer. So it was a high personalized dependency. Um, and we can discuss if this is nowadays still the case. Um, I just want to show this very nice image. Um, they also had some technology. This is a mechanical vacuum cleaner, just as an example. So they had a lot of mechanical technologies uh, already introduced. So this means this is also not new. So when after when um, everything was electrified, so they just add the electrical power source to their mechanical uh, household equipment. Um, what I want to highlight by these is that the electrification, so what we see here is um, a source where electricity is produced. This is, I mean, similar to the internet. So now the household depended on a 
source outside of the household, of an energy source. So it was not the energy of the human domestic servants inside, but later on, it, it you still dependent on, or you even more dependent on an aus, outside energy source. Uh, however, without necessarily feeling quite dependent from it, um, specifically as long as it is invisible. So and that those things, there might be some similarities because nowadays uh, maybe we all use apps and order things or order food and we don't necessarily feel dependent. Uh, however, of course, we are very much dependent by uh, this centrally controlled supply system like the internet and also still, of course, the electrical centrally controlled supply system and also the apps and the platforms and the people organizing and managing the platforms and the algorithm um, the platforms and the apps are based on. Um, however, we are not really very much aware of, of, um, of these control usually. So we can also say that both sides are controlled. It is the customers um, who use the apps, but also these live out domestic servants um, using the apps as their um, walk equipment, as a walking tool. So, um, it is a, a kind of paradox, um, as I said, because also the private household, the bourgeois private household, they already relied on the human energy resources, but later also on, on other energy uh, resources. So um, they did, it was a kind of open system, but of course the bourgeois household, the impact of the, on, on the bourgeois household by industrialization was kind of quite mediated. So they, they kind of uh, benefited uh, first that they could still rely on the domestic service servants uh, doing the work in the household, and um, they were not the people who were directly uh, affected by industrialization because these were not the people working in the industrial factories. But later on, uh, more and more among the domestic servants, they had even chosen to work in the industry and in the factories, and there was a decline of the availability of domestic servants, and this is when actually an even greater industrialization of the household took place, because uh, now they relied on these external power sources, electricity as uh, going on like nowadays um, we rely on the internet of and when it comes to organize our private life. Um, I see that uh, time is running, and um, I I don't really want to to talk about social digitalization because I've already made some remarks early on. So I have a different. I have a. a, a, a I mean, I'm talking of social digitalization and not digitalization, and I have a different kind of argument that social digitalization already uh, took place before we had contemporary digital technology. So um, this is a theory I, I'm talking about and I'm exploring in this book, but I don't think that I should introduce more of it. Um, given the fact that we are already running out of time, um, I would like to stop here and I would like to invite questions. Well, thank you very much, Cornelia, about um, your 
excellent presentation. I would like to add uh, one more thing about social digitalization, which is a great book I kindly suggest to everyone to have a look at because it really nails um, the theoretical approach um, Cornelia has introduced us today. And um, it's really an excellent book, especially I appreciate personally the, the last chapter that contains a summarize and a wrap up of most of the topic uh, discussed today. And uh, one thing I appreciate very much about today's talk was related to the notion of privacy. And uh, eventually I would like some more insight uh, according to you about uh, how in the digital global digital society, privacy is changing and is uh, reshaping uh, the boundary between uh, private and public domain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, this is, a, um, I think it is a, a great question. I've already introduced the transformation of the public sphere by uh, Habermas, this very famous theory. And I, I do think that everybody knows the theory. Um, this is why I refer to it. Um, it is wide, widely known. And um, so the point is he refers to the 1800th century. This is when um, it starts. And in the, in the 1900th century, um, we have already a, a public sphere. And I do think that the very idea of these theory of the transformation of, of the public sphere is already the interplay between private and public. So at, at the one hand side, it looks as if there is a clear divide between private and public when, when it comes to bourgeois culture. So that they introduce this divide, that something should be very privately. Um, for example, all their political discourses, so particular in the 1800th centuries, when it was forbidden to gather and to have political discussions um, and particular discussions uh, in the age of enlightenment, particular discussions uh, against the ruling, the ruling class. Um, so it had to be in privacy. It had to be uh, confined to, to certain spaces. And later on, it was uh, kind of opened by um, having these discussions in the newspapers, reading the newspapers. There was a huge number of newspapers in the 1900th century, much more newspapers than we have today. So again, but this is a parallel to the internet. Today we have the internet, but not so many newspapers. They are kind of dying out. Um, so there was a huge number of newspapers uh, read and then also discussed, so a very intensive discourse. At the same time, so um, we do have, um, I mean, this is a kind of um, privatization. At the same time, we do have a kind of opening in the way that things are made public. Uh, for example, with of obviously with the newspapers, but also political discussions were gradually allowed. And, um, we have um, parties, we have political gatherings and, um, and uh, so on. And still, um, the idea, I, I do think that the idea of um, a private household, a private life plays a huge role. And this, uh, we see this by the ongoing discussion uh, of the conflict, the potential conflict. Um, fostered by the internet. So what should be made public? What should be kept private? So um, my idea is that um, I, I do think that it, it might sound now um, kind of odd. I, I mean, I'm, I'm very critical um, when it comes to centrally organized communication like the internet or some some uh, way or, or economies you know whatever is centrally organized so we should have a critical look on it however at the same time 
I also think we should have a critical look on the, the bourgeois concept of privacy, which we are kind of cultivating again and again. You know, do we do we need to have like, I mean, um, a, a certain meal times? Um, do we have to to follow? Uh, these uh, strict cyclical routines, or do we have to have a very elaborate kind of individualization so that we can share, for example, meals? For example, the whole idea of having um, shared meals, which are, um, I'm not talking of, of course, you can share a meal with by a Zoom call, everybody sits at home, or uh, um, a group sits at home and um, everybody orders a dish and then you can share it on Zoom. But what I'm talking about is that uh, the whole idea that, for example, um, local production of uh, dishes or also a local, local institution for doing the washing. So all these was abolished, either abolished or it was never properly uh, implemented instead. So for example, we had uh, the idea that every household wanted to be equipped by a washing machine and that it is, for example, regarded as um, non-favorable at all to that your laundry is mingled with the laundry of your neighbor, for example. I mean, you don't have these shared washing machines or washing facilities, also professional washing facilities. I mean, we had all these things already more than 100 years ago that um, with the invention of steam power. So they had also huge facilities for, um, for uh, where people could just bring their laundry to and, and could pick it up. So it was also quite inexpensive, was also very uh, convenient, but we don't have this idea anymore. So it was never really um, popular. And um, what I do think that um, I'm not against, of course, any, um, any, um, I, I, ideas that people have a demand and a want for privacy. But um, I do think that it has economically, it has a great impact if all these private households are run as single units. And um, also, of course, social ecological impacts. And everybody um, um, has is, is the, uh, every unit is a, is an economy by itself, you know, and uh, gets the food delivered, does the own washing, uh, for example, and um, you know what I mean. I mean it is uh, that that to I mean to cut it short, that's the idea of having a private life, which is not even so much private because it depends on sources outside. So it is a paradox that it is really private, but the idea of, or the feeling of having a private life, and this is what you, you, you need this kind of privacy, even there's no privacy um, in many ways, um, that it also has negative impacts, for example, on uh, these, increase of precarious jobs, you know, it is uh, the one, it is again like in the bourgeoisie within one house, so there are those who serve and those who are getting served, and we have this kind of divide again, so we have those who can afford to being served by all the servants, the outsourcing everything, and those who have to provide these services on demand, and which is not um, often a quite favorable job, or the job conditions are not really very favorable. These are job conditions who wouldn't easily be accepted by those who actually demand these services.
I don't know if I answered your question. I mean, I know Raza answered it by the examples later on, but it is a very broad question. So you can answer it very broadly and generally or <laughs> by the examples. Absolutely, yes, Cornelia. It was an excellent uh, reply and I'm very satisfied about your comment and reply. Thank you very much indeed. Yes, thank you. Do we have another question or if? Uh, hi, Dr. Patelia. Um, Thank you for the wonderful talk. Uh, so I have this small question uh, that like now these platform economies are uh, offering an opportunity for the worker to get into an independent contract, uh, like uh, being a partner to the company with a certain notion of autonomy and also with flexible working hours. So it's unlike the domestic service work that you mentioned where it's a kind of patronage relationship. So how do you, like, what do you think, like how is this uh, independent contract, the opportunity to get into an independent contract and the autonomy, notion of autonomy and flexibility of working hours affecting the privacy of the worker? Um. Yeah, I mean, I'm getting your question very well. And uh, this is, to me, this is a question. I mean, you you call them independent workers and I, I, I can, in the gig economy, and I can, I, I do understand and I also know the research on it. And uh, um, that, and the point why, why I'm now, why I changed to this slide is because I want to make a, it is in reference to your question. So I want to make a certain point by looking at these slides. And what I do want to highlight, can you see the slide? I see the, this what I wanted to show it is. So I have the pictures in between anyway. Um, so I hope you see it in, in the way I want you to see it. So, I mean, as, I, as I'm saying, this is a very question to me. I mean, I do see, that they, the people feel very independent, but to me, it is a question. So um, for example, what, when, of, of course there are not, to me, there are similarities and there are also differences to the domestic servants 100 and 150 years ago. Um, but the similarity is rather that they, um, even though from our standpoint nowadays, so we, and from your standpoint, maybe you say, okay, these people were not independent and they had to compulsory live in with their employees, employers, and of course we don't have these today. And of course, this is not what is acceptable and gig work. So they have their work contract, they are independent, they are kind of self-employed um, and so on. However, um, they, they really, I don't, I don't see that the, the differences are really divided in that way. For example, um, the domestic servants, they did like this work very much. So initially, so for example, uh, there were a lot of mostly, uh, girls and daughters from working classes from rural area who, who come to the urban environments of these huge bourgeois households. And it was a kind of luxurious environment to them. So they were better off living there than working, for example, in a, in a factory and maybe they could just uh, afford a shared room with so many other people. So they were living in a kind of, um, luxurious environment, the pay was low. However, they could basically, the idea was to basically save this pay um, because accommodation and food was already provided. So they didn't need money on that. So they wanted to save this payment for a few years and they aspired to uh, getting married, having some money for their own household spared by their previous work and um, also to have having kind of a training of a household and 
they kind of aspire to also having a kind of bourgeois lifestyle. So what I want to say is that uh, most likely they didn't succeed, you know, because they never had so much money to entertain such a huge bourgeois residence, you know. But they, um, what I want to say is that they had the idea that they actually spent provided, I mean, of course, it's very individually provided so they were not too much exploited by the bourgeois families, that they had some good, good years to spend, you know, they were at least kind of also liberated from their uh, families, um, and at least on Sunday afternoons when they were uh, not controlled, I mean, this was very close time frame, of course, very strictly, however, they were not controlled, they could go out, they could socialize and gather with others. So they didn't really perceive it as very, very bad, you know. And I do think um, this is this is also, I mean, when I, on this slide, you see sense making, contextualizing, co-programming. And this is the point I want to highlight, um, that they had signifying practices to uh, um, kind of um, coming to terms with these work conditions, you know, and uh, don't, I mean, I'm talking now of the 1900th century, not, not, not feeling very much deprived by these working conditions, you know, and at the same time, I do think, I mean, I'm talking of the negative side of the gig economy. Yes, and you, you are talking of the positive side of the gig economy. And um, what I do think, and what I wanted to talk about later on after our break, or I can also do it now, so it doesn't matter when I talk about, that it is the very same thing. This is for me, for me, this is a very, um, very um, relevant point that those working in the gig uh, economy, they again have the feeling these jobs are not really so bad, you know, I mean, at least they have a work contract. However, it is a job, I mean, you are on call and um, it can, I mean, it is not a lifetime job. However, for example, for those um, particular also migrants from rural area or from other countries, uh, who don't speak the language, they might really see it as a very good opportunity. So I totally agree with you. But from a perspective, a sociological perspective, when you compare the working conditions of different jobs, you know, I mean, you then these are the jobs which are referred to as precarious. But this is the very point. Why do people do it? You know, and I do see that as a when you contextualize it and when you look at the sense making um, procedures, and I have some empirical results um, from our own research, when you look at the sense making procedures, you do clearly see that they make sense out of this job. Like the domestic servants in the 1900th century as well. <laughs> Yeah, thanks for your question. Thank you. So <laughs> let's, let's have a look on this. Um, so we had uh, two years ago, but we resume this year. So it, it was not uh, carried out during the lockdown and uh, this extended COVID period. Um, so we carried out interviews with um, workers in the food industry. I mean, not just delivery service, but also preparing food. However, not trained cooks, but who did kind of assist or heated industrialized food and um, provided it to the customers. Um, and the point is exactly what we were talking about, the subjective perspective of the worker. So we were interested in how do they themselves present them. So we didn't ask um, specific questions. So it was unstructured. 
and we just ask them if they can talk about their job experiences. It is an exploration and um, we just wanted to see the range and all the dimension of um, they were talking about when it comes to um, make sense out of their job. Um, we had uh, 16 uh, respondents between 25 and 50. Um, and the majority were migrants to Austria from European countries. Um, and I mean, I, I, I just want to skip all this kind of thing and I just come to the patterns. Um, and what we found out is actually that um, we have three patterns of negotiating the job and to make sense out of the job. The uh, first type, I mean, we can distinguish three types according to this research. The first type is the floating one. So they try to immerse themselves into the work system with the apps and um, the schedules and everything. And they want to float with the rhythm of the task. So the tasks are coming to them. I mean, they are indicated on, on their um, uh, apps and uh, then they do this one task, wait for the next task. Um, and they just want to float um, with it. And the second type, um, you see these are five among the 16. Um, one interview is missing data. So we have, uh, no, we have 20, we have 20. I, I think we have 19, it is not 16. We have 19 interviews. Um, five people among them are, can be referred to, to the type of floating with the system. And the second type, nine people. So this means much more. So the majority of our respondents um, or the half of the respondents, uh, they are very attentive to the current task and the connection to the overall work system. So they make sense out of their job because they are very aware of, okay, uh, I'm doing that and I'm doing it because the overall work system is this. So I, I contribute to the organization of the whole system. So I'm a part of this system and um, they are very responsible in their attempt to, to contribute to the system, to being a um, very useful part within a whole system. And uh, the third type, five people, so um, they, uh, they are focused on their own individual situation. For example, I mean, I've already said mostly there were migrants anyway, but for example, family relationship, legal status, so can they, I mean, which kind of job can they, um, uh, can they take, you know? Um, sometimes they don't even want a, a job contract, for example, uh, it, depending on their papers, but also family relationship. What I want to say is that uh, if the utmost goal is to support the family back home, then um, they don't much care about what kind of jobs they do. So what, what counts is that they can fulfill these tasks, that they can support the family back home. And um, then it doesn't really matter to them. So uh, they are very adaptive. This is how this type is called by us. They are very adaptive. So they adapt to the system and to, to the working conditions. Uh, because their goal is um, lies in their private life, so to speak. So they, they have their, their private goals. Um, first of all, this very frequently uh, making money and supporting the family back home. So this is a kind of um, differentiation between the sense-making types in this gig economy. Yeah, Laura, you need to let us know what we are going to do now. So I'm happy to take question, of course, but maybe we have the, the, the ideas to have breakout rooms. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that we can discuss these things in smaller groups. And I also, I just thought that as a discussion input, 
um, is this plausible? I mean, this would be my argument that there are non-technologically platforms like cultural concepts, privacy, global social inequalities. Uh, a lot of people need to also take jobs which might have precarious job conditions, personalized lifestyle of demands. So which kind of dishes, elaborate dishes needs to be um, brought to the house, either produced in the house or brought to the house. Um, yeah, this would be a discussion input. And I, 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 I don't know how many that, now I can't see the, the number of participants. Yes, this discussion input, I think, is great to start a debate. Given that we are 10 people with you, uh, we could do something like three groups, three each. So, okay. Three. yeah, okay, this sounds very good. It sounds good. The idea is that maybe for a quarter of an hour, so you discuss it among the, the smaller groups and um, you might come up with more critical questions or additions or whatever. And then I have a final round of comments to your discussion questions. Perfect. Like the algorithm and even the like the managers, loan officers also also depending on the same algorithm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, of course. I mean, they, they are within, I mean, they depend on many other people within the system. However, um, it is, I mean, they are controlled in that way. Yeah. However, it might be a kind of control which is really favorable for the customers. You know, they can rely on that they, or more rely on that they don't decide according their private um uh, advantages or whatever whatever they have you know that there is a, a very formalized system um deciding on who gets the credit or not yeah, yeah i do think it is fascinating that it has so many aspects you know it's not black and white so it is not yeah. like the digital technology. This is my message, you know, <laughs> and <laughs> so the the frame of the whole research. It is not that digital technology is bad and non digital uh, technologies or going back to fifty years ago is would be wonderful. So not at all, you know. I mean, it has it is so complicated, you know. It has so many aspects, and um, you need to see it from the perspective. This is my message from the perspective of different people of of different social groups, you know. I mean, also the very technology can be very favorable for the one group of people, but not favorable for the other one, you know. It can have a lot of advantages for for one social group, but not for another social group. So my message is that. Um, um, we, we should analyze it not being based on the technology itself, you know, what the technology does, but based on how the technology organizes the digital worlds, or how is it called, social worlds, how it digitalizes and platformizes the social worlds. worlds. This is, a, um, of course, the title of your, of the summer school. <laughs> Interesting. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Cornel. That was really, and Kalpesh, it was a really interesting discussion. I don't know if we have any more insights from the participants. And in the meantime, Abhiram, you wanted to add something? In the meantime, I saw that Gillette and Professor Joanna Tlacha has just joined us. Thank you, welcome to the summer school. And Cornelia, what do you think? Are you satisfied with the discussion input or there was anything else you'd like to um, highlight or focus on? Um, no, I don't think that I should highlight. I've now highlighted. <laughs> a lot of things so i'm yes very happy if i can 
if I had inspired the discussion or the reflection and of course also the um, opposition, <laughs> you yeah. know, maybe. Uh, and I really enjoyed the discussion and it also inspired me, the question inspired me as well. That's great. That's really great. Yes. And I mean, it's inspiring talking about paradoxes, you know, <laughs> that's always really insightful. And um, yeah, so I, in five minutes, so thank you a lot, Cornelia. Really, it was a great lecture and open debate. I really enjoyed it. And maybe uh, in a few minutes, I don't know if Gillette and Joanna, would you like to, maybe we could wait to do a little break of 10 minutes more or less more yeah, or less. sure mm -hmm. yeah we can we can start i don't know in uh, five or ten minutes yes if, i'm sure yeah. if all participants are okay with this program okay so we will be back in 10 minutes and uh cornelia i ask you uh, to interrupt your screen uh, sharing so that i can put on the yeah. Okay. So, I mean, thank you very much. Um, and I wish everybody a uh, very, very short break. I wasn't aware of that you continue immediately. <laughs> but so I wish everybody a very interesting and uh, rewarding experience. Also. Yeah. Thank you, Bonnie. Next talk. Thank you. Entire summer school. <laughs> bye bye. Bye bye. Really enjoyed being with you. Thank you. Thank you, Cornelia. Really, thank you.